Hi, and welcome to our service. If you're new here, you may be wondering who we are and what this church is all about. Well, the heart of the matter is this. We're a group of people doing our best to love God and love those around us. One of the ways we express this love is through worship because our God is truly amazing. He created everything, great and small, and his love for us is incredible, powerful, and completely unconditional. We also spend time looking into his word, the Bible, and receive practical teaching to guide us along his path in our everyday lives. But it doesn't end when the service is over. Throughout the week, we gather in groups to serve, pray, reach out to our community, and sometimes just to hang out and have fun. Life is full of challenges and none of us are perfect, but we believe that's one of the reasons God has brought us together. We're all here to help and support each other through each step of life's journey because nobody should have to travel alone. So thanks for joining us today. No matter who you are, we want you to know you are welcome. Good morning. Welcome to church this morning. Please stand and join us for worship. One day I was sitting out on my front porch and I just realized that I kept getting tempted right and left. And it wasn't gonna stop. Then I remember what my pastor said and he said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Well, I decided to do just that, except I decided to flee. So I ran. I ran clear to the end of the counter. I figured since I made it that far, I might as well keep on going. I ran for a long time. When I got hungry, I ate. When I got tired, I slept. When I had to go, you know, I went. I stopped and did Bible studies sometimes, ran to churches and ran through town. 
people started seeing me and I ended up getting some company. I ran for six years, four months, three days and 12 hours. And I realized that I couldn't escape it. Temptation is everywhere. So I decided it was time to do something different. I'm kind of tired now. I think I'm just going to go to man camp. Well, good morning, church. All right, Man Camp 2022 is upon us. It's coming up very, very fast. Last week, I forgot to show my sample shirt off to you all, but look at that beautiful shirt that all you men can get if you sign up and come to the Virginia District Man Camp. August 21st through 23rd, there is a sign-up clipboard out there on the table. Uh, there's already a few names down. Make sure you get signed up. Come and be a part of that. You will not be disappointed. It was an amazing time in the Lord last week, last year, and this year it's going to be even bigger and greater. So men, get out there and get signed up and uh, give your wives a weekend off from you. I thought the women would say amen. Uh, well, it's good to see each and every one of you this morning. Uh, I know uh, some of you are saying, boy, where's everybody at? I have one of those weeks where everybody said, hey, we're going to be away this weekend. We're trying to get rid of that last summer run or that last summer trip before school starts up. You know what I love about the end of summer and school starting? Everybody's back because they have to be back because of their kids being in school. So anyways, and look around, take a look and uh, send a message to those. Let them know they're missed. There's a whole mess of inserts in your informer, informer. Uh, and ladies fall retreat is coming up as well for the Virginia district, October 14th and 15th. Men, I joke about you leaving your wives, but hey, you can kick your wife out the weekend before you go away. You know what that means? Two weekends apart from one another. Still not many amens. <laughs> Apparently, everybody's in love here. So anyways, make sure you check that out, ladies. Information is in there. Also, this coming Saturday, August 13th, here to Win Church from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, it is the Ladies' Prayer Walk. If you have any questions about that, uh, see Kathy, but a lot of the information is right there before you. Following today's service, there's a couple things happening. Walt, our Sunday school superintendent, is going to be having a brief Sunday school meeting with teachers and substitutes, correct? And the and the uh, count his education council. Also, out in the prayer garden following service, uh, Mark and Joanne are celebrating 10 years of marriage, and they wanted to do a vow renewal. So uh, they are inviting any of you that would like to come out to the prayer garden for just a quick, simple uh, rededication to one another, and maybe she'll change her mind this time. I don't know. But uh, anyways, there we go. <laughs> uh, you're welcome to join us in the prayer garden for that brief ceremony. That'll be a good time together. Also, uh, verse of the month. The new month is upon us. There's a new Bible verse to remember as a church, so make sure you grab that, put that on your refrigerator. Remember that as individuals and together as a family. Another insert that we have is Nazarene Missions International. You'll see that almost every week. It tells you what's going on in the wonderful world of Nazarene Missions and all the prayer needs. So make sure you take that, and as always, keep praying over that. And since I introduced that as the last one, this is my time to introduce our missions president, Catherine Matowski. She's going to come and share a moment for missions for the month of August. I've got a lot to cover today, so I'll try to make this fast. But first, um, has it been hot enough for you guys? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm wearing short sleeves, and I like the heat, so you know if, uh, or sleeveless, so you know if I'm wearing sle no sleeves, that it's really hot. So I looked this up. This is actually what we call the dog days of summer. And I'm going to read my notes here. The dog days came, saying came about when Sirius, which is the dog star, would appear in the night sky just before sunrise, which starts in July, and that marked the beginning of the very hottest days of the year. The Romans referred to this period as um, dies caniculares, or dog, days of the dog star, which was eventually translated into just dog days. So a little piece of trivia for this morning. Um, so we're actually coming to the end of the dog days of summer. Yay, it's gonna be cooling down. Um, but 
I thought it was a good time to do another drive for the Highland Food Pantry. And so I'm naming it Dog Days Diaper Drive. And guess what we're gonna be doing a drive for? Diapers. <laughs> um, but we've all felt the effects of the current economy and everything's more expensive. And that's even if you can find what you're looking for in the store these days. Um, so having children is quite expensive. You think about it when you have a new baby, you've got the cost of um, obviously diapers and wipes, you've got stroller, playpen, crib, um, age appropriate toys, you've got the formula, you've got food, clothing, they're constantly outgrowing their clothing. Um, so that's why I decided to focus on diapers because um, right now with the economy and for you know young families, that could be really a strain on their, um, their budget right now. And the average child, in case you aren't figuring this out, I'm a trivia person, the average child will use about 7,000 diapers in their lifetime before they're potty trained. So that shows you the need. Um, so we're doing the diaper drive for the, uh, for the Highland food, food Pantry for the next two weeks. Um, the details are here in the Winformer and you can bring in diapers or wipes and we'll have a box out in the foyer for that. So that's um, size the first. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, is that what the food pantry told you? Yeah. Okay. I put the most common is three and four. So listen to Dan. He, I'm sure he's smarter than me. <laughs> no, <laughs> right. I was we work at the diaper shelf on Tuesday and they had, we used their entire stock and they had none left. There you go. Size And four. So look, at, isn't this timely? Isn't it amazing how God works? Because he happened to work there and has that information to share and had no idea I was doing the diaper drive. So, um, so moving on. Um, Proverbs 22.2. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. So God doesn't look at how rich or how poor we are. He loves us all. And um, Proverbs eleven twenty five, a generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. So I wanted to share those two um, verses with you. I'm going to jump into the next section I have, which is talking about our missionaries, the Domros. Um, I probably shouldn't have said that, but imagine that you worked full time. And then and when you were not working, you were still on call. Your employer said that they would pay you, but they can't tell you how much you would get paid or how often you would get paid. A lot of us couldn't work under these conditions. How do you plan for your food, clothing, utilities, and other costs? Um, most of us want a little more security in knowing how much we're getting paid and when we're getting paid. But then let's add in a, a couple more things to that mix. How about a spouse that works with you under those same conditions? Um, and you have two kids to support as well. And you're in a foreign country. How secure would you feel in that? Um, a lot of us, I think, would be really uncomfortable. And this is basically the scenario that missionaries work under. In June, I in introduced the Domros, who are our Lynx missionaries to Paraguay. They're ministering to the youth in Paraguay, and they're also doing some church planting. and. Um, they stepped out, missionaries step out in faith, uh, trusting God that, will, that God will provide for them, but they don't always know how much or when. So um, I did, in, in one of my communications with the Domros, I did ask if they had any funding needs. And what they had told me is that they would appreciate a monthly pledge that would help them plan their budget more effectively. Basically, a monthly pledge is where a church would pledge to provide a set amount to the missionaries each month. We get to determine how much, but we, we pledge that we will always give that amount each month. So that gives them a little more security in knowing how much income they have coming in that month. They can count on that pledge. Um, I think we can do this as a church. I mean, we're a loving, caring, and giving church. But I don't want to make a commitment to the Domros that we can't uphold and meet that commitment. So what I want to ask everyone today is to think about committing just $5 a month 
to the dom rows. Um, this would be above your tithe, above what you donate to the money, the, the missions march, or any other ministry that you have here. Just $5 a month specifically for the dom rows. That's less than 20 cents a day. I ask that you pray about this, and if you feel you can, please start making that $5 donation a month this month. You can add it to your tithe just before share to mark um, that on $5 is for the Dom Rose. You can put it in one of our offering envelopes, mark it on the envelope that says on the here, like how much for tithe offering. There's other. You can just mark Dom Rose $5. And anything we collect for the Dom Rose, we will um, will be directed to them. But what I also want to do is I want to track this. I want to see what can we do as a church because I don't want to make this commitment until I know that we can meet that whatever we commit to. So we'll track this and then um, starting next year, next church year, I'm hoping we can make a commitment to the Dom Rose so they know that we they can they can rely on Winchester First Church of the Nazarene for a certain amount each month and give them a little more security as they go about doing the Lord's work in Paraguay. And um, you're probably thinking, wow, she's doing a lot of asking for money, asking for donations. Yes, yes, today is that. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't plan, I know last week Pastor uh, preached about tithing. Again, didn't plan this. Um, I've had this in my heart, on my heart uh, for a while. Um, so I, it's just a coincidence, or it's God telling you something, one or the other. Um, but I do want to give it, have a disclaimer here. We need to take care of our own. So, you know, if you're donating to the food pantry, if you're donating to the Dom Rose, or feel that you, should, you feel like you're being pressured to, it's not that. If you have a need yourself, we need to take care of the people in our church. Um, you know, if you have a specific need, if you're one of those people who, uh, you know, can't make ends meet each month, please talk to the pastor. He knows, he has resources he can direct you to. Um, this is not a shakedown. Um, this is asking you to pray and to be obedient to what God is calling you, what he tells you in your heart. And if he doesn't put on your heart that you should be donating, then, then that's not it. He probably is putting something else on your heart, that you should be doing work, um, maybe going on missions trips or something else. But listen to your heart and pray about this. So I'm not saying this is not a shakedown. This is, this is pray and listen to what God's saying to your heart. And um, then I want to kind of prepare you for what's coming up in September. This is my last thing, I promise. Um, twice a year, the Nazarene Church does a collection called the Alabaster Offering, and that's in February and September of each year. So coming up in September is the Alabaster Offering, and um, I will be having them run videos uh, later this month to kind of lead you, give you some information about what it is, but... Let me just read from the um, Nazarene, Church of the Nazarene site. The Alabaster offering provides funds for property and buildings around the world. While we understand the church consists of the people of God and not a building, buildings erected for the purpose of ministry help provide a sense of permanence, functionally enhance ministry efforts, and convey an attitude that the Church of the Nazarene intends to put down roots in that area. Use of the alabaster funds are used for new churches to purchase property or church building, purchase or build a church parsonage, build a church building, conversion of a property into a church gathering space, meet initial costs for renting a church meeting space for a limited period. And they also, alabaster funds may also be used for purchasing or building missionary homes, purchase or building regional or field missions facilities, or building or repurposing buildings on Bible college campuses. So that's what's coming up in March, and I want you to be thinking about the alabaster offering. I want you to be praying about it. Um, as I said, in the coming weeks, we'll be sharing some videos about the alabaster offering. So start preparing your heart for that, for what God wants you to do, what God wants you to give in September for that. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, the only shakedowns we do around here are we allow the kids to shake down. So here in a moment, I'll dismiss the kids for their shakedown. They have a license to shake you down because, well, they're cute. Amen? So, uh, but real quick, I just want to tag on talking about the Highland Food Pantry. Um, I work in what's called the intake room. 
And uh, I do know this month was one of those months that the more people that came through my table, they were asking for the diapers. And I did know that there was a shortage of a size, and some of them are running a little bit lower. Um, so basically what we did, I don't know if you guys were able to accommodate everybody down there because we're in two different areas, but we always have to tell the people when they take their diaper ticket, um, we'll give you this, give this to them when you pick up your box, and hopefully they'll have that size because we can't guarantee because we don't know the, the inventory when we're up there working. So I hope you guys were able to accommodate everybody, but I do know this past Tuesday between morning and evening shifts at the Highland Food Pantry, they serviced 120 families. They helped 120 families this past Tuesday get the needs for their homes. So it is a vital ministry, and I'm thankful that we are a part of that, and we've partnered with them this year. So uh, kids, if you are ready, it's time for the shakedown for missions for Loose Change. So come get your cups, and let's go get it. Rejoice 
kids, you may be dismissed for junior church at this time. A few moments ago, we sang that song, Today is the Day. And today is the day that the Lord has made. So what should we do? Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You can turn in your Bibles to, I forgot where I was. I almost gave you the wrong one because I'm starting somewhere else. 
I want you to be in Philippians chapter 2, and we'll catch up there here in just a moment, but I want to preface it with where uh, the Lord has just really stuck me over the past month, over the past four weeks, and that is Psalm 119. I think it was three or four weeks ago. Uh, I preached on where the Lord had had me, uh, which was the first 16 verses, and I just I want to read those to you again before we jump over to the New Testament to Philippians. Because as I was studying this week, uh, just the Lord just awoke my spirit in a whole new way with the same context coming from Psalms, but also joining Psalm 119 with the book of Philippians. Don't you love the fact that you can go all over the Word of God and it all links together? I don't care where you go, what time of day, what you're doing, what you're going through, it always links together. There's always a purpose contained within God's Word. Do you believe that this morning? But Psalm 119 verse 1 starts, Blessed are those, those whose way is blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep His statutes and seek Him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in His ways. They have laid down precepts they, they are, that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying Your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. Verse 9, I love this. This is the million dollar question that we looked at. How can a young man or a young woman, let's add that in there, keep his way pure by living according to your word? The word keeps us on a path. Amen. Amen. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Do you know how much further the Lord has taken me from verse 16 in the past three weeks since I last preached this to you? No further. I am camped out in those first 16 verses and I'll blame, uh, I'll blame our Sunday school department for putting out last month's uh, memory verse, Psalm 119.11, I've hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. But there's so much more than that. That's just, not just a, that's just not just a blanket statement covering what we should be doing, but it is a standard by which we should live by as God's people. We should put His Word in our heart so that we might not sin against Him. Now, we, we have an enemy that's always at work in and around us, and he camps out around us. Can it, is it fair to say that the enemy camps out around us? Is it fair to say that the enemy's pretty good at what he does? And he's always tempting us. He is always trying us. He's always trying to get us to go another direction. And that direction is never the same path as God. Uh, the direction that the enemy wants to lead us is not within the will of God. Am I right in saying that? The last place the enemy wants us is to be within the will of God. So the only way to stay within the will of God in my book is to stay within his book. Amen? Do you believe that this morning? God's Word is our path. It is our light. It is the GPS of life. Amen? And I believe to stay within God's will, we need to follow it. Hide His Word in your heart so that you might not sin against Him. So the question in verse 9 says, how can a young man keep his way pure? Well, by living according to your Word. If you believe that, say amen. The only way to keep your path right is to live by His Word. His Word is the golden standard. Amen. And I believe that whenever God issues a decree or a standard by which we should be living, it is not an option. But here's the deal, and this is where it becomes a slippery slope. It's not really an option because it's a decree of God. It's a standard of God. And if we call ourselves God's people, we should be living by that standard. But since God never ever forces Himself on us, since God never ever takes our arm and twists it behind our back, we have the option to choose. And see, it's the choosing that makes all the difference. Amen? You may choose to stay within His Word. 
which will help you and aid you and assist you in keeping your way pure before God. But you also, since God is a gentleman God, does not twist your arm, you also have the option to say, no way. It's my life. I'll do with it what I please. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't force himself on you? Amen? He's a gentleman God. But the relationship changes so much when we choose to partner with him. So how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. Verse 11, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. But verse 10, right in between those two passages says this, I seek you with all of my heart. Do not let me stray from your command. So what you see is, a, is an honest, heartfelt desire to, what's the wording? Verse 10, to seek. An honest, heartfelt desire to seek. And seek is what? It's a verb. It's an action word. So to stay within God's decree, we have to seek Him out on all fronts. That requires action on our part because it just does not happen. Amen? That means we have to actively pursue God. This is a chasing after God. Seeking, looking, wanting to be a part of what God is doing and what God wants to do in your life. I will seek you with all my heart. And I love the attached prayer. Do not let me stray from your commands. And God says, okay, I can do that. In fact, I've already done that. I've given you an instruction manual by which you can live by. Aren't you thankful for instructions, men? <laughs> See the little chuckle? <laughs> Women, aren't you thankful for instructions? Don't you wish your husband would use them? But I think it's all fair to say, man or woman, boy or girl, we should all be following basic instructions before leaving earth, otherwise known as the Bible. Amen? Live by it. Live by it. And it's simple. Uh, a good lay pastor that I had the privilege of being his pastor in, in Texas already said, my mother always taught me, if it's in the Bible, if it says to do it, do it. And if it says to don't, don't. It's simple. Amen? Decrees to live by. Standards to live by. So that is where I have been these past few weeks, and I just can't get past those 16 verses. But in the meanwhile, while I'm doing that, I'm trying to cross-reference quite often. And I have about, I think, 50, I've lost count, 50-plus Bibles in my office because I like to collect Bibles. And I've been going through all the different versions, looked online, all of these different things, and I've not been able to find uh, exact cross-references, but I have found myself staying away from the cross-references. One, because I've been struggling to find links that I want together, and I've just been asking the Lord to show me, to show me, and to show me. And this past Tuesday, I was doing just a little study on my own, Psalm 119, and I'm like, Lord... Just, just show me an area real quick that would just that would just blow my mind since it's not in the cross reference cross reference, but it almost reads the same. Could you do that for me? And do you know when you ask the Lord to do that, those things, He will do them. And I was just happened just happened to be scrolling through a Bible program that I have, and there's like a list of devotions that I've saved as my favorites. The first one I clicked on was where I told you to go. Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, the devotion was from Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, which those read like this. Philippians 2, 12 says, Therefore, my friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Now, if you really sit and focus on that, which I'm not going to make you sit and stare at it for 10 minutes and read it over and over, but if you were to sit and to just marinate in that for just a few minutes, you would see that there's a linking in where we just were in Psalm 119. The question, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. Verse 10, I will seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. Verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart 
that I might not sin against you. And then you go to verse 12, Therefore, my dear friends, if you have obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So how is a young man or a young woman to keep their way pure, to stay within the way and the will of God? Well, you have to actively seek the Lord as we saw in Psalm 119. And since seeking is an action word, I'm linking it with verse 12 here of the working out your salvation. The only way to maintain and to nurture your salvation in Christ Jesus is to actively seek Him. Or as it says in Philippians, Paul is telling the Philippian church to work out. How many of you love to exercise? Yeah. I'm just raising my hand to see if you'd raise yours. I'm, obviously, I don't. This body just didn't happen. Anyways, oh, I worked out all right. <laughs> God is commanding us to work out our salvation. He gives this message through Paul. Work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. Your walk with the Lord is your own with the Lord and before the Lord. It's nobody else's but your own. And you must work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. Fred cannot work out my salvation. Catherine cannot work out my salvation. My wife cannot work out my salvation. You must work out your salvation with fear and with trembling before the Lord. Now, does that mean I walk through life going... <laughs> no, it's a healthy fear. It's a healthy respect before the Lord. Me, as a follower of Jesus Christ, my goal in life is to be within the will of God. And it's something that I have to work out as God's child. And it's something that you must work out as God's child. Do you realize your pastor can't even work out your salvation? It is between you and God. It is personal. It's a partnership that needs to happen. And Paul is telling the Philippian church here, Work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. He says in verse 13, For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to good purpose. It is the Lord that works in and through us. And we must work out with God. God is your partner in working out. Isn't that cool? I don't know how you picture God as your workout partner. Maybe it's like the guy who's on the cover of your wind former of how you picture God as your workout. He's kind of like a cheap version of Richard Simmons. Just out of curiosity, I'm going to say how many of you be honest on this. We're going back to the days of the video cassette. Oh, VHS. Who, who loves the good old VHS? Woo. Today's generation, cassette tapes. Today's generation will never understand the pencil technique of fixing a cassette tape. That, that, that the struggle was real. Amen, church? And that was the most disheartening thing when you were driving down the highway in the 1980s and you were jamming. Oh, I can go back a little further. The 8-track worked the same way. You were jamming down the highway in the 80s. You were jamming to your favorite tune and all of a sudden, then the tape spits out. And the, the cassette player just pukes out your tape. Wasn't that the most disheartening thing to happen? It's like you'll never, you know, today's world, there's like, I'll just download it. <laughs> Downloads never get stuck in the player, amen? They never get puked out of the stereo system. Oh. We should make today's generation spend one month with cassette tapes so they can know our pain and grief, amen? Now you got cassette tapes, eight tracks. How many of you had the reel-to-reel -reel system? Oh, you guys are freedom rock. All right. <laughs> good old days. But back in the good old days of the VHS, there was this, uh, when TV commercials were doing, starting up the infomercials and all that stuff, and you had the Richard Simmons specials. Remember that? 
the, the good old, you buy this VHS, Richard Swet, Simmons, sweating, was it sweating to the oldies? That was one of them, sweating to the oldies. And if you call now, you can get this, extra sweating to Christmas music. I don't know what all we did, but there's always that extra offer. But how many of you had the Richard Simmons video cassettes? Just curious if you'll be real with us today. One, two, three, four. Let's go, ladies. There's four of them. There's all us, man. Uh, I talked about Richard Simmons once, and I said the next time I talk about Richard Simmons, I was going to have Pastor Dan dress up like Richard Simmons. Totally forgot. Totally dropped the ball. Let's just take a poll again. How many of you would love to see Pastor Dan dressed up like Richard Simmons? Raise your hand. All right, it takes a church two-thirds majority vote. Dan, you're, you're in. You're in. We'll get this done soon. Maybe we'll have a special night where we just have a bunch of fun, and Dan will make a special appearance as Richard Simmons. Do you think you could give us 20 minutes of sweating to the oldies? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the only sweating he does is looking for a deer. Anyways. But my heading says this before this scripture in Philippians. Shining as stars. Let's go. Let's go a little bit further. Let's pick up in 12 and then go a little further in this. Therefore, my dear friends, if you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of the Lord that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Now, Paul gives three things, three actions that are, I would call them convictions even, that we should have within our mindset as a follower, as a, a Bible-believing Christian, a, a Bible-believing Christian who is a child of God and who actually just is somebody who is enamored with His Word. Are you enamored with His Word? And when I say enamored, I mean I, you just can't get enough of it. When I say enamored with His hurt Word, you just... You hunger and you thirst and you long for His Word. In fact, the times of the day that you are busy with work or doing things, you are missing being in God's Word. Are you that kind of Christian? Are you enamored with God's Word? If you're not, maybe you should think through that question. Am I getting enough of God's Word? You know, I was walking through the house yesterday and Kathy, I think it might have been two days ago. Anyways, it was one of the days that ended in Y. Um, but for those of you that don't know every day ends and why, I just want to make sure we're all clear. I was walking through the house and she was, she was in a devotion or an area of scripture and she, uh, was just, she, I think she was about ready to wave a hanky and run the aisle if we had one in the house. And, uh, she, she had to take the time to share with me. And you know what I loved watching the excitement that God's word brought into her in that moment. And by the time she was done with her 10-minute sermonette, I'm walking in the kitchen going, yeah. Was, it, 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 it spoke to me. And it blessed me just as it blessed her. We should get that excited about the Word of God. Right. Now, the Word of God is not always pleasant to the ear, is it? Because sometimes part of God's Word convicts us. Sometimes the Word of God can, for lack of better terms, turn us over God's knee. You ever been turned over a knee? Whacked on the backside? Sometimes the Word is used to reprove us and to, to wake us up and to discipline us. I, I've been whacked upside the head with the word, word of God so many times. Have you just look into the Word of God and are like, oh man, I've messed up. I'm not perfect. Are any of you perfect? So I, I think it's safe to say that if any time any of us have ever got into the Word of God, 
there's probably been times in our lives where we're probably like, ouch, that's speaking to me. But in the same process or that same moment, you're saying, and thank you, Lord, for speaking to me. Thank you for showing the error of my ways. It leads us to a whole new level. It changes us, amen? It transforms us. It speaks to us right where we are at. Don't you love that? How many times you open the Word of God and it speaks to you right where you are at? So Paul is saying here, verse 16, as you hold out the Word of life, so as you digest it, as you read it, as you soak in it, this is a goal that he wants for our life. He's speaking to the Philippians here when he says, as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. Can I tell you, every time you get into the word of God, it is not in vain. Every time you get into the word of God, it never, ever returns void. I challenge you to pick an area of the Bible and you can join me in Psalm 119 and I guarantee you week to week or month to month, every once in a while Psalm 119 is going to be making an appearance somewhere wherever the Lord has me within Psalm 119 because it's blessing me. But I have found so often in my life if I just marinate in one area. Some people think they've got to race from cover to cover. So that way when they get get to the pearly gates, they can say, I've read it 17 and a half times. If God would have gave me another month, I'd have had it all read again. You don't have to have cover to cover umpteen million times. That's not a huge qualifier. The huge qualifier is how your heart matched the word, how your actions match the word. And Paul is saying here, hold out the word of life. Let it be your banner. Let it be your guide. Let it be who you are. Just overflow the Word of God in all of your actions, all of your words, all of your deeds. Everything that you do, let it be the standard. Amen. And then we jump clear down to verse 18. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. When I get into the Word of God and when God's Word speaks to me, I rejoice in it, and I am glad in it because it helps me. It is your constant help in and through your life on this earth. So my challenge to you, whether you join me in Psalm 119 or you go to another area of Scripture, just find something that just, boom, hits your spirit. Whether that be flipping through or you can do a topic search of maybe something you're going through right now, do a topical search. Just look at it and look for a word. And then there'll be a list of scriptures. However you want to do that. And start looking at an area of scripture. And ask the Lord to speak to you in and through that scripture. And I challenge you not to just do a one and done. Don't do a drive-by reading of that scripture. But soak in it. Jump in it. And just marinate in it. And then from there, that's just your central point. Always come back to it to begin. The next day, maybe go to another or cross-reference or something else associated with that. But always come back to it. The next day, start there and go to another one. And before long, you've got this whole big span starting from one foundational truth that just totally blows your mind as to God's goodness, His grace, and His mercy in and through your life and in your situation. I have done... Um, I heard the, the practice of immersion in a revival with Stephen Manley, and I've shared this before. There's been a few times since then that I have immersed myself in one area. The other one that I did as of uh, the past four years was Psalm 91. I'll tell you why. If you camp out in Psalm 91, you'll be a changed person because you'll realize you are a very protected person. You are a very blessed person. It's an amazing thing. Psalm, I dare you to study Psalm 91. It will bless your socks off. So right now I happen to be in Psalm 119 and it's brought me to here. But our text today in verse 12 starts with this one word and I want to share something in closing here. This whole Philippians 2 verse 12 starts with this word, therefore. And we all know therefore is in a transitional word that speaks to what was just said before. So I think in closing, 
We need to see what Paul was saying just before that. And I think it'd be fair to say that would be a good challenge for our lives. A lot of pastors, and I say it often, be a challenge for our week. But I think this should become a challenge for our life. Amen? I don't think the word should ever be relegated to one week or one day. It should change us for life. But verse, verse 1 in Philippians chapter 2. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in spirit and purpose. Verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but to the interest of others. And this is big. He says in verse 5, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then he says, therefore. So part of this working out is also making ourselves not an equal but making ourselves nothing, just as that of Christ. So as you go from this place today, and as you jump into his word, as you study his word, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. So as you navigate life from here on out, as you go through your journey of life from here on out, can I tell you it's okay to have an attitude? I want you to walk out of here with an attitude. Some of you are saying, yes, I knew I was right all these years. But I'm talking about one kind of attitude, the attitude of Christ Jesus. So have an attitude this week and the rest of the days of your life of that of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord. Lord, just so thankful for your word. And Lord, when I say your word, my heart is warmed my heart is stirred because your word is a game changer. Your word is a life changer. Your word brings meaning. Your word brings depth to our lives. And Father, may we be standard bearers of your word in the world in which we live. Lord, as we go from this place, as we journey through life, may we become enamored with you. May we become enamored with your son. May we become enamored with the precious Holy Spirit. And Lord, may we just become ones who just feed on truth through your word. Lord, I just pray right now for each and every one that is here with us today, those that could not be with us, those that are joining us online. Lord, may they just have a blessed week. And may each one of us just be found right smack dab in the middle of your will in all that we do this week. Father, we want to honor you with our lives as individuals and as a church. Father, we just ask all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people say together, amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for sharing your Sunday with us. If you are a part of Walt's Sunday School meeting, make sure you meet him in the fellowship hall by the kitchen. And for those of you that would like to join, we'll be meeting down in the prayer garden for Mark and Joanne's uh, vow renewal in a few moments. God bless.